Yang Hong, please get started. Great, thanks. Thanks, Robert, for chairing the session. Uh, first, I want to share my con condolences uh, to people in Israel uh, for the events, tragic events uh, unfolding over the past few days. I also want to thank uh, Gringer and also E for uh, organizing the session, assembling the uh, US uh, delegation. So we want to focus on energy storage. And as uh, uh, Ambassador, uh, Warwick uh, highlighted uh, we need to essentially significantly reduce our CO2. We need to do so uh, in the coming decade, and we need to continue to reduce CO2 significantly in the subsequent uh, two decades uh, to 2050 in order to maintain uh, a temperature rise uh, less than two degrees. So our CO2 emission come from transportation, uh, come from uh, our use of buildings, and come from our processing of materials, as well as uh, agriculture. So we, if you want to reduce uh, CO2 emission, decarbonize, we need to figure out ways uh, how to uh, reduce our fossil fuel use uh, in sectors of transportation, in buildings, and how we make materials. We have great opportunities with uh, more renewable energy coming online, right? So energy storage can play a very important role to connect our energy supply, electricity from renewable energy to energy demands. Uh, batteries or lithium ion batteries are poised to decarbonize, electrify light duty vehicles. Uh, for example, the CO2 emission from our conventional uh, internal combustion engine-based vehicles, 80% of CO2 emission come from tailpipe. So if we can make them electric, we can significantly reduce the CO2 emission come from light-duty vehicles. Um, we need essentially more um, energy-dense batteries if we want to electrify and decarbonize heavy-duty vehicles as well as aviation. For our buildings, uh, we need both electricity and also heat. So we need to figure out ways how to decarbonize heat. One way of envisioning decarbonized heat is through electrolysis, using the electricity come from renewable energy and to generate hydrogen or generate hydrogen carriers, or even generating metals uh, through reduction of metal oxides. So we can have carbon neutral or decarbonized uh, heat through the process, which can be utilized to, uh, power, uh, to provide a decarbonized heat in our buildings, as well as uh, for our industrial processes. And for all these, essentially, uh, uh, innovations, we're looking at battery technologies, we're looking at electrolytic uh, cell technologies, as well as a uh, fuel cell technologies, where we can essentially utilize the free, uh, decarbonized energy carriers and convert them back to electricity uh, when needed. Uh, well, uh, these uh, technology help us to uh, decarbonize transportation, uh, buildings, as well as our industrial sectors. We also need negative emission technologies to reduce or capture carbon and do carbon management uh, to help us deal with essentially existing uh, energy infrastructure. So let's look at... Um, lithium-ion batteries, right? So if you want to accelerate our energy innovation, clean energy solutions, we need to think about time, we need to think about cost, we need to think about scale, and also we need to think about a training or transform a training of our workforce uh, for a new energy infrastructure. So lithium-ion batteries uh, cost has reduced uh, by 10 times over the past decade, and it has a worldwide mass production, uh, which allows lithium-ion battery to have uh, significant reduced cost in the past decade, uh, allow it to electrify light-duty vehicles. Uh, the innovation of lithium-ion batteries in the past decade or two has driven largely by materials innovation, in particular uh, innovation of active materials. As you can see from the cost of the batteries, uh, largely come from really the negative or positive electrode materials. A lot of different oxides, uh, innovation, material chemistry that had led to the improvement of performance of lithium-ion batteries, such as energy, life, and 
and safety and et cetera. And I would want to sort of highlight uh, going forward, uh, while well, electrolyte is a small fraction of overall material cost, it is a fundamental science or fundamental technologies that would seed all future advanced uh, battery innovations in this space. Uh, for example, uh, innovation in the solid state batteries lead to you know, development, potential development of uh, lithium metal batteries. And this is what uh, uh, I hope uh, Professor Jürgen Janik will discuss in more detail, as well as looking at innovations in liquid and polymer electrolyte can potentially develop drop-in technologies that can leverage the large massive manufacturing capability of lithium ion, which I believe this will lead to uh, potentially uh, uh, longer lasting uh, high energy batteries as well as uh, low cost uh, battery uh, technologies. And if we want to accelerate our discovery of electrolytes or discovery of our materials for uh, energy storage, uh, combining with uh, combining experiments, uh, high throughput experiments with computation, DFT, MD, uh, machine learning, uh, it's really key to be able to not only figure out what is the mechanism, the molecular or atomic level mechanism of ion conduction or ion diffusion, right? So what are the moieties that actually are conducting or carrying the charge, and how to design the future next generation of ion conductors. So for example, we don't understand why the, the best known ion conductors uh, is actually uh, with a conductivity cap at something like a 10 to minus one Siemens centimeter. Is that the theoretical limit? So can we uh, have an ion conductor that can be you know, 10 to the two, for example? Right. So these questions that we can es essentially address or accelerate uh, through a combination of uh, uh, high throughput experiments with a robotic uh, automated research uh, with uh, computation of a different methods. And this will, of course, uh, allow us to develop, develop active learning loop uh, to accelerate uh, development of our uh, new uh, electrolytes, either liquid polymers or solid state. So now once we have, let's say, innovation or concept of uh, battery chemistry proven in the laboratory, and that essentially we can, we're at a TRL level one, right? So we need to essentially demonstrate uh, capability of production, uh, a scale up uh, of such a process and production of materials and cell devices, and to essentially to translate uh, to commercialization uh, at uh, TRL level nine, right? So I take these slides from uh, Tian Zhou, uh, who is a DOE program manager overseeing energy storage and battery over the past uh, three decades. And you can see that uh, lithium ion batteries at uh, TRL level nine, so commercialization, there we have many other uh, technologies that could have give us more energy, lower costs, uh, longer lasting, um, and they are at uh, reduced uh, or much lower TRL level. So the question is, how can we accelerate uh, the, the translation and go through essentially many value of deaths as going from TRL level fundamental research to translation and uh, and this is hopefully we hear more uh, from e session of scaling up and uh, translation what are the uh, you know uh, learnings and uh, we can actually bring uh, people uh, together to accelerate uh, trans translation. Beyond uh, translation, going through valley of, of death for commercialization, uh, the technology scaling up can be also limited by availability of materials. And, uh, and I take this slide from uh, my colleague, uh, Elsa Arlivati, uh, who's a material science uh, professor at MIT, and she really looking into what are the challenges in a supply chain in energy materials. And her point uh, here is that how critical a material is, is different from how scarce material is. And have this consideration is really important uh, to uh, develop uh, scaling strategies for various uh, materials. So if you look at uh, battery materials, and if we look at copper, lithium, uh, nickel, cobalt, uh, they're really concentrated uh, in the production of these materials are concentrated or processing of these materials are concentrated in very few uh, countries. 
um, uh, in the world, and where uh, we need essentially lithium-ion batteries worldwide, and uh, where essentially the, the most demands of uh, EVs, for example, uh, in, in Europe or in U.S., they're actually limited uh, uh, processing of uh, these materials and production of these materials. Right, so that's a challenge we face, how we uh, think about uh, more collaboration as uh, some parts of uh, our, our world is decoupling from certain regions in material supply chain. As well as uh, to accelerate, essentially, uh, translation, accelerate development of clean energy solutions, various countries have introduced, um, essentially, policies to accelerate uh, domestic production, domestic, uh, essentially, uh, production of uh, various uh, uh, technologies. Uh, for example, in the U.S., uh, Inflation Reduction Act, the CHIPS Act, and bipartisan infrastructure laws, uh, as well as in other parts of the world, uh, there's many of these uh, policies encourage domestic of production, the scaling up of energy technologies or critical uh, materials. And so the key challenge here is how do we ensure um, collaborations across uh, different parts of the world so that we can work together uh, to accelerate uh, essentially the uh, work and development of these clean energy uh, solutions uh, across the globe. So I just want to uh, conclude, uh, we need to accelerate the pace of scientific discovery uh, by essentially working together across the disciplinary boundaries and to look at atomic uh, or molecular design of uh, interfacial processes, either we're trying to um, do direct air capture where we want to do batteries or fuel cells and try to understand interfacial processes, essentially controlling the rate and power and life and safety of, of these devices. Uh, we need to essentially accelerate uh, a translation and innovation uh, of these clean technologies, uh, potentially uh, facilitate uh, um, material processing and device making uh, at scale so we can accelerate uh, the, the translation and as well as connecting different stakeholders, let's say policy, techno-economic analysis, uh, with uh, technologists so we can shorten the time of uh, commercialization. And lastly, perhaps and most importantly, is really attract a brilliant mind to uh, these challenges so we can train uh, entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneur thinkers and doers, uh, so they can essentially uh, develop and accelerate uh, development of these technologies. And I want to really highlight, uh, you know, I'm in mechanical engineering and our curriculum uh, are still uh, largely in the energy um, space that focus on thermal fluids. And it's, uh, you know, really important to, uh, to transform so that, uh, you know, universities are now, our education system are pulled by, essentially, uh, by our uh, sort of society uh, industrial efforts. Uh, to decarbonize, and uh, we uh, also need to essentially think of paradigm shift in how we educate uh, future uh, scientists and engineers. So with that, I just want to conclude, it's really important to, to consider a time, or shorten the time, how to really uh, lower the cost, and how to uh, increase uh, scale, and then largely how to train and uh, mentor uh, future uh, engineers and scientists and uh, entrepreneurs. So thank you so much. So uh, first of all, uh, we'll have to apologize in, uh, in advance. If there will be an alarm, I'll run with the computer to the shelter. So hopefully everything will be continuous. But we can have any, momentarily, we can have alarms here. Anyway. So uh, the, the first slide is, uh, you can see, I, I, there are several people uh, who contributed to what I'm going to show you. Uh, you have the, the title. Um, uh, we, we deal with electromobility and the large energy storage. You see the location of our university, the middle of the coastal plain, uh, aside to the main highway of the country, of the country going from uh, south to north. Um, and also I mentioned, uh, uh, work with the companies, as you can see, Nichia, Quora, BSF, ATL, GM, they are related to our efforts here. 
So uh, before, maybe before I start with the scientific part, I should also say a few things about leadership. Uh, the energy group at the Bar Ilan University are leading the, 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 the country uh, in, in several, in several uh, initiatives that I want to mention. So some, uh, about uh, uh, nearly 12 years ago, we started INREP, is a national research uh, uh, center for electrochemical propulsion. propulsion. It's still working. Uh, we're talking about uh, 28 research groups uh, for seven institutions working on electromobility. We turned, uh, we turned um, uh, competition uh, to collaboration, working on all the relevant solutions uh, to electromobility, including a very strong branch of hydrogen uh, economy. Um, this consortium uh, was broadened to uh, be, uh, to, uh, we, we, we broadened to, to uh, the, the consortium, but, but before then, we uh, initiated Bar Ilan University uh, BUSES, the Bar Ilan University Center for Energy and uh, Sustainability, working on seven clusters, as you can see, energy regulation, engineering, network, uh, geography, environmental, uh, environment and, 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 and society, uh, uh, education, ecology, climate, earth science, 55 research groups from eight faculties. Energy is broader than just the chemistry and the electrochemistry. Regulation, engineering, networks are also very important. So we 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 we, we work in a, in a broad scope, and then um, we we enlarged uh, INREP to INERC, Israel National uh, uh, Energy Research Consortium. Now 33 research group from seven uh, universities. One of the leaders of INERC is here, Iris, uh, with us. Uh, she leads the uh, solar energy branch, and the the and the, and the uh, driving force to to come up with this initiative was a very nice collaboration that we have with Morocco, with a similar consortium. We're talking about dozens of Israeli scientists working together uh, with dozens of uh, Moroccan students. Uh, we have now Moroccan students coming to Israel in an exchange program. Uh, the Moroccan side is well financed by the OCP, by the phosphate, uh, the big phosphate uh, uh, company of uh, National Phosphate Company of Morocco. And uh, this can be a very nice. Uh, uh, this can be very nice uh, example of a, of of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a different Middle East, and we hope to uh, to uh, extend the collaboration uh, to Jordan, Egypt. Uh, uh, we have a lot of good things to do in this area uh, uh, <clears throat> instead of uh, fighting. And um, uh, starting um, um, last month. Uh, we opened the Israel uh, uh, National uh, Research Center uh, for Energy Storage together with scientists from the Technion. And this is something that uh, will bring together a co uh, the academy, industry, startup uh, company, and the, and the government. And the idea is to unite all uh, the, the, the powers in Israel, all the forces in Israel, to work changing the, the, the energy economy of, 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 the, of the country and to meet the challenges that is well dictated by the climate crisis. So now I'll go to, uh, this is just from the organization point of view. So I believe that the Israeli uh, uh, scientific community working on energy storage and conversion is well organized. We have uh, uh, many students that we educated. We have very good manpower that we sent up uh, out uh, we have new startup companies, so hopefully uh, we, we, we will come with, the, with very good uh, news. Um, so next, uh, we have uh, we have four uh, four needs. We have uh, portable devices, electromobility, electric car. We have high energy density, line, uh, uh, still electromobility, but for unmanned aviation, drones. Here we need very high energy density. And we have the, the great challenge of large energy storage. I will deal with two aspects of electromobility and large uh, energy, uh, energy storage. Um, so um, always there is a question of uh, uh, electromobility versus uh, uh, internal, co uh, 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 <coughs> internal combustion engines. And uh, our competition in, from scientific will come from uh, biofuels. Uh, and, and still there are investment on biofuels, but the idea is to get rid of uh, the use of fossil fuels 
uh, and it appears that uh, when we go to elect electromobility, the, the efficiency, even if we use fossil fuels, the efficiency for electromobility can be greater compared to internal combustion uh, engine. And of course, if we add um, green energy uh, from renewable sources, electromobility win. And uh, the, if we look, for, we compare the right side to the left side, we believe that the left side is winning. And, think, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, in, indeed, I think all the car makers now have very solid uh, programs to develop electric vehicles. And uh, this, uh, this, the, the, this is taking off. When we talk about electromobility, uh, electric vehicle is in all the uh, story, as you can see in the, in the left uh, up uh, corner. From more than 200, 220 years ago, we started with electric vehicle, uh, but now we have much more, more modern models. We have to remember the, 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 the challenge. We cannot change the car, uh, but we have to, we should give the driver all the accessories, all the comfortability. This means that we have to replace whatever belongs to internal combustion engine to electricity. So we have a space of 150 to 250 liter and 300 kilograms to 500 kilograms uh, weight space to put batteries to put electricity. And the question is, what is the energy density we can put uh, inside? We have to remember, we talk about electro, uh, 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 batteries for cars. Uh, we start from cells, and we have single cells uh, uh, connected in, cells in parallel. Uh, it's important to work with small cells in order to control the uh, heat dissipation and also to control the individual cells. Uh, but they, they are, they, these are composed to models. Uh, the, to the, the battery, the, the battery have a lot of patents of uh, battery managing system, of cooling, uh, but everything starts with the chemistry. The chemistry is the most important uh, issue, what we put in the cell in order to reach uh, an energy content of around, let's say, 80 kilowatt hours with a uh, weight uh, between 200, uh, 300 and 500 kilogram and a, a volume uh, between 250 and, 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 and two, two, 150 and 250 liter, where we can put this, this piece of energy and in, in such a way to drive 500 kilometers even more between charges, um, and we do, we we can do it. We do it now. Now 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 we do it, and uh, we are we are in a good shape in terms of durability and energy density for electric vehicle. But there, there is a, a, the issue of fast charging, and here I uh, I don't have uh, too good news. I think we should give up fast charging because always. Uh, energy density goes on the uh, account of uh, of uh, power density. Uh, energy on the account of power density, and in many cases, energy density is more important. And thereby, it means that we have to we have to wait uh, a little bit more to complete charging. Yet, uh, within few minutes, it's possible to, uh, to to charge a nice part of the of of, 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 a, of a battery. So I believe that uh, we are talking about uh, now about practical uh, uh, practical uh, technology. So when we think about electromobility, there are, of course, hydrogen economy. I'm not touching here hydrogen economy. The best uh, batteries for uh, electromobility are lithium ion batteries. The idea is we have two compounds. The cathode contains the lithium ions, and then uh, the anode is usually graphite. The graphite is the best anode. If we're trying to, to use the silicon, uh, we, we will see also the use of lithium, but, but graphite is, is still the best. Uh, the, the lithium is, start, is content in the initially in the, in the cathode that we have a rocking chair situation of the ions coming back and forth between the electrodes, uh, and we have uh, in, in the in the right in the right side uh, you can see a chart. It's voltage. It's a, it's a voltage versus a discharge capacity in milliampere hour per gram, and uh, this is governed by the type of the cathode. The cathodes dictate. The, uh, the performance in terms of voltage and voltage profile and specific capacity. And we have several uh, uh, compounds. I should mention the, the, the layer compound, the, the, blue, the blue curve is uh, important. And also, we have also the lithium ion phosphate, the olivine. So, uh, so the olivine, the olivine type of, uh, of uh, materials also is important. Uh, here we may give up energy, de energy density, but you can uh, obtain the best safety and, uh, and, and, and durability. So the best composition for uh, electric, electromobility in terms of from, from energy, uh, energy density point of view 
is uh, the so-called uh, nickel-rich NCM cathode material. So we are talking about cathodes, uh, layered structure, cathodes comprising the elements lithium, uh, nickel, manganese, uh, and, and cobalt, and oxygen, with a stoichiometry of lithium-1, or the transition metal-1, oxygen-2, minus two. and uh, within the transition metal, the composition is important, the content of the three elements is also important, and as we increase the amount of nickel, we climb up the road here, and we uh, increase the specific capacity. What is nice about this compound is that we can extract the maximum specific capacity when uh, charging up to 4.3 volt. And this means that we are not endangering too much our electrolyte solutions. We can manage at relatively low voltage, we can extract most of the specific capacity. And as if we go up to LNO, full nickelate, then we can have at a charging potential of less than 2.4 volt, or at, 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 I'm sorry, at the charge potential less than 4.3 volt, we can obtain something like 240 milliamp per hour per gram initially, and this is very nice. But as we go uphill, we have problems of phase transition, uh, uh, stress, cracks, and uh, we have uh, a problem with the stability and uh, uh, also safety. So what we do, well, there are several ways to, to manage, and I want to show you now a work, a common work, uh, but uh, it's a collaboration between me and, and Professor Yan Kuk San from Hanyang University in South Korea, in Seoul, South Korea. And we, uh, we find, in, in fact, we work for, for a decade on doping. It appears that if you add it to, the, to, the, to a, 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 a compound like nickel, it layered lithium nickel oxide, you doping, doping like tungsten, like zirconium, even aluminum, uh, in small con concentration, less than 1%, you have very unique processes you have segregation, something happens to the surface, something happens to the bulk, and this mitigates the stresses and the cracks and the, and, the, and, the, and the propagation of cracks to the surface and percolation of regular solution inside the material. And we demonstrate that with less than 1% of doping by nickel, and we use here a, 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 what we call a, a bottom, bottom, a bottom up, uh, a, uh, the synthesis, we put the, the dopants within the precursor from the, from the beginning, and it appears that the, the, the calcination made the final change. And uh, what, what I show in this slide, the, the, the messages is compared to the black curve, to the red curve, and you can see the stabilization effect uh, uh, thanks to the, uh, to the uh, doping. Uh, this is because both bulk and surface, and we complete analysis. I can talk about it a day, uh, but I just what I want to show here is that we can hold the the the, the, the ox in his horns. Uh, we, we know how to manage, and we and we demonstrate even thousands of cycles in in full cells. You can see here data taken from uh, doped uh, nickel-rich materials compared to the to the standard, which what we call NCA. Nickel cobalt aluminum. What Tesla is uh, using in its uh, in, in its vehicles. So uh, all of these uh, curves, uh, which is the uh, specific capacity versus uh, number of cycles of full cells, demonstrate the improvement that can be reached by uh, doping. And whenever and, and and this is very well justified by uh, uh, postmodern analysis, where we look at the particles, we look cross sectioning, and we see how we mitigate the stresses, the strains, and the cracks. Uh, so everything is, is coherent, and whenever we get good stabilization in electrochemistry, we also good thermal stabilization, so we are in a good, uh, in, in a good shape. Now, now let's move. Uh, and so this is the best. These materials, the nickel material, are the best for, for electromobility. Uh, uh, this is the, in terms of uh, the compromise between energy density, safety, uh, durability. So we, we, I believe that we have here a very real uh, and good solutions. What, what will be the, the final choice? Uh, I can tell you that for electromobility, we may give up some, we may give up some, uh, some, uh, uh, some energy density and go to more to less dense, uh, less energetic uh, cathodes like lithium, uh, lithium uh, uh, iron phosphate uh, in order to, to gain better stability and, and, and durability on the account of energy density but this is another discussion. So now I move to another 
aspects of electromobility, which is high, very high energy density. For that, we have to get back to the resistance, to, to, we have to apply a renaissance to the lithium metal anode. Uh, lithium metal anode is the highest, it has the highest ZV capacity. So lit rechargeable lithium metal batteries are the best of the best in terms of energy density. But there is a, the, the, an issue which is well described in the left part. So we have here, here the upper, uh, the upper uh, 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 row here is what happens upon the lithium deposition and upon lithium dissolution. So lithium naturally is covered by surface fields. All the protection, all the, the, possibility, all the possibility to 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 use such an active material in batteries is thanks to metastability, which is reached by natural situation uh, of uh, surface field formation. They behave as a solid electrolyte interface. And uh, this is the famous SCI term, uh, but SCI is a model. Uh, we have surface similar different uh, a, a type, depends on the chemistry. And uh, over the years, we studied how we control the surface field and, and then the, the, the stability and the, and the uh, passivation. So the, the surface films are never uniform and thereby uh, there are always spots where we have a higher current density. And this means that when we deposit with dendrites, when we uh, dissolve, we have a break and repair mechanism. So we have always cracks and we have also lithium, fresh lithium, which is being exposed to solutions and we have side reactions. What we would like to have is the right side, surface films which are flexible, we want to have a situation where we can control the surface in a way that we have first surface units that accommodate the morphological changes and in such a way, and, and yet uh, conduct lithium ion uh, lithium ions and, and, and they accommodate the morphological change. So lithium be, uh, remain uh, uh, protected throughout the operation. And we succeeded. It appears that if we use fluorinated solvents, look at the uh, compounds here. We have FEC, fluorinated ethylene carbonate, and D fluorinated ethylene carbonate, the, this structure allow a unique surface chemistry on the surface. We go to fluorine, we have dehydrofluorination, we, we form double bonds, and we have very fast polymerization on the surface. So we have very interesting matrices comprising polymeric species which are flexible, in which uh, a lithium ion compounds formed by reduction of these compounds are embedded, like lithium carbonate, lithium fluoride, that, you, that are used as lithium ion conductors. And indeed, what we found that if we have electrolyte solution in which we have both DFEC, FEC, and uh, general uh, uh, material like uh, uh, dimethoxyethane, and the standard salt, lithium ion, uh, 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 lithium hexafluorophosphate, we have a very interesting mechanism. So I, 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 I look at the, at, the, at, the, at the right side. We have the, these two fluorinated species are working together. The, the most reactive is the def defect. And uh, uh, we have a, a healer, which is the FEC. The FEC heal whenever we have cracks in the surface. Sorry, field. think about time, please. What? You're way over time. So I will, uh, um, so I will, I will, uh, now, I'll, 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 within a couple of minutes, I will, I will do a very brief, uh, brief, uh, uh, <clears throat> brief uh, 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 description, and, and 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 I will be uh, done. Uh, well, I, I I I built on an extra time uh, because of the Daniel did not give his talk, and uh, in, in some in some sort I cover a little bit uh, because we work together with some collaboration. Uh, so. Now, it appears, so how we exploit it? We, uh, we took a, a, a lithium cobalt oxide. Uh, we demonstrated that we can charge it up to uh, 4.6 volt. And with, uh, in such a way, we extract very high specific capacity. We found coating. We, we use our uh, magic solution with fluorinated uh, systems. And we demonstrated uh, a very high, high specific capacity. We can reach in cells more than 400 watt hour per kilogram, which is very nice. And we demo demonstrated durability uh, during thousands of cycles. And by postmodern analysis, we demonstrate the stabilization effect of, on both the lithium side and the cathode side. Now, the last point, I do it very quickly, relates to the uh, large energy storage. And uh, 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 well, there is, I, I skip this. This is uh, something about solid state batteries based on LNO. Uh, I skip it. I go straight 
to, uh, to a larger storage. So uh, this was dealt. I don't have to talk a little bit more about it. We have the harvesting by solar, wind, and we have storage as a major challenge. Uh, if the world uh, 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 produce five terawatt electricity, it means that uh, for, 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 for solar energy, uh, 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 full green uh, energy economy, we need a storage of 120 terawatt hour per day. And just for Israel, uh, that is now uh, producing uh, 20 giga gigawatt, and very soon uh, it will produce 30 gigawatt. We're talking about something like half a terawatt hour per day storage. This is a huge amount of materials, and this poses a very serious issue of abundance of elements. So we have the best system, the best system for larger storage. If we would have enough lithium, is the combination of graphite and LFP. We can come up with 3.3 volt battery. You see the green arrow. Combining this cathode, you see two, plat two, two uh, electrochemical responses of the material. This is for the, cat the cathode, LFP, and this is for the anode. Now remember, uh, uh, the, the specific capacity of graphite is twice uh, the, the, the specific capacity of, of uh, LFP. So look at the, the graph. This is just half of the specific capacity of graphite. It goes up to more than 350 uh, milliamp per hour per gram. Such a combination provides the best, best durability and also the best energy turnover because look at the very smallest resin between charge and discharge. Uh, so this is the best system. If we had enough lithium, we are done. But because we don't have enough lithium, we have to go to sodium ion battery technology. And here we have a very nice follow-up. We cannot use graphite, but we can use carbon materials. This chart in the upper right demonstrates that carbon, hard carbon can be used as negative electrode. And fortunately, we have a plethora of materials that can be used as cathode material, and we can definitely find a cathode material uh, with a very abundant element on earth, iron, manganese, uh, sodium. When we move from lithium to sodium, then uh, we don't have problem. And fortunately, uh, sodium ion battery technology follow up relatively nicely um, lithium ion battery technology and we are struggling for durability. So this is the best technology that we can offer for large energy storage uh, in, uh, if we deal with electrochemical uh, power sources. And finally, thanks to my group and thanks to all the companies and, and, and entities with which we collaborate. And thank you, Chairman, very much for uh, allow, allow me to complete more or less what I uh, prepare to entertain you for this afternoon. I'm working uh, in battery system engineering at Avetia Aachen University. And um, I would uh, show something about uh, the markets, uh, manufacturing, the battery system technology issues. Um, as we discussed, uh, I will show a little bit more what happens uh, here in uh, Germany, especially with regard also to manufacturing, uh, because the scaling up uh, seems to be uh, here of uh, most importance. Nevertheless, uh, I would like to say in advance, in the face really of uh, the suffering in Israel, it is not easy to go back to business as usual here, and therefore I would like um, at least uh, like to express my sympathy here for you, your relatives and friends. Thank you very much. So we see a strong way towards electrification in all fields, also those uh, which were discussed in the last years, maybe more for hydrogen. Uh, there's lots of uh, activity now going for battery electrification. And when having heard the uh, presentation of the colleagues uh, from industry this morning, I have to say I'm always happy if uh, we find applications where we can use electricity and batteries directly because there will so much need for the hydrogen and other fields um, that uh, we probably should be happy uh, to direct it, especially towards industry and uh, the, uh, the energy sector uh, it itself. And we see this in other applications as well, even heavy trucks in mining, this truck has uh, shown there has 375 kilo, uh, tons of weight uh, when it's loaded. Um, the mining companies go to electric, um, uh, battery electric uh, driving here. 
So the markets overall, meanwhile, we have uh, something like um, 25 million electric vehicles on the road, uh, roughly half of this in China, one third in Europe, and uh, the rest distributed to the um, United States and uh, to the other countries. Um, the forecast for the battery demand in the global markets um, is um, here in the, in the Bloomberg uh, forecast, which is roughly somehow in the middle of the different ones. And this says that uh, towards 2035, we are expecting a market um, volume of about um, um, 4,500 gigawatt hour battery capacity per year. Just to translate this, uh, roughly taking 100 euros per kilowatt hour on a battery pack basis, this is a 450 billion euros annual turnover uh, here just on the uh, battery side. Um, another thing relevant here is 10% um, of this goes into stationary applications, 90% into mobile applications. This is the case today, and all the uh, prognosis for the future show relatively stable uh, conditions with regard to this. So it's the automotive industry which rules this market uh, completely and which assures uh, the economy of uh, scales. So one of the things we're really discussing a lot is what really is innovation in this case. Yeah, so what really matters. If you look to the priorities in the battery development from the automotive manufacturer's point of view, it's cost reduction and fast charging. Yeah, these are the most important things yeah, because they both are directly uh, or can be felt by the users. Yeah. Energy density, to be honest, is not of major concern. Yeah, so, because even if the car is 200 kilograms um, uh, heavier, this is what you don't feel as a driver because electric motors are so strong. And um, on the right-hand side, we can see a diagram uh, from uh, about the chemistries. Uh, uh, was just explained what LFP is, uh, and you can see LFP is increasing significantly in the last years, mainly driven by China, it's taking one third of the market. Meanwhile, and the important thing is the energy density is roughly one third less compared with the high uh, nickel, manganese, cobalt rich materials. Uh, so, um, whereas we, especially in Europe, but also in the United States, focused a lot on higher, better, uh, more sophisticated batteries, the world went on and developed cheap batteries. Uh, and uh, this is something what we really should uh, take into account and uh, uh, things become cheap, and this was demonstrated well, nice by Bernd Recht this morning with regard to photovoltaics, and same as in batteries, is if we get into large-scale production. Uh, so we have to concentrate on relatively few technologies to bring down the cost. It's not the technology itself which really makes a change, it's the price at which we can offer this uh, into the market. And it's not only LFP, now it's upcoming the sodium ion battery, also mentioned by other colleagues this, this morning. Again, a technology not uh, higher in energy densities than LFP, but cheap. Yeah? No lithium inside anymore, um, and um, this uh, helps uh, surely in, in the market uh, significantly. So what happens in, um, in Germany and Europe, especially with regard to cell manufacturing, Europe and Germany want to become less dependent on battery cell imports, uh, called also sovereignty. The current situation is there are some cell manufacturers in Europe, but they are all Asian and they have production sites here in Europe. Uh, Tesla is on the rise to uh, produce battery cells in Grünheide, the state of Brandenburg, and uh, there's no gigafactory from European-based companies in operation yet. Yeah, so we're totally dependent on, on the imports. And this is why German ministries, uh, but also the European Union, uh, putting a lot of money on the table, uh, quite similar to what happens in the field of microchips, uh, to establish battery manufacturing in all uh, elements of the value chain here in Europe, including the so-called IPSI programs. This, these are the important projects of common European interests where money is paid directly for investment into factories as well. And in addition, I would like to mention also that uh, there are lots of uh, activities regarding recycling. The European Battery Directive is out and it defines very clearly about uh, how much batteries have to be returned, the recovery of materials, and also how much recycled materials must be used in new batteries in the future. 
Regarding manufacturing, the ministries uh, have uh, financed in the last year several pilot lines for battery cell production. Uh, they are, the most important ones are listed here at universities, at uh, Fraunhofer Institutes and uh, other independent uh, research organizations. And in addition, um, since uh, two, two, three years, uh, there is now ongoing the setup of the Fraunhofer Research Institution on battery cell production. This is a 600 million euro investment to set up um, yeah, a um, pilot manufacturing line uh, where the transfer of new battery concepts and production technologies uh, coming in somewhere in the TRL level of five to six uh, should be improved towards serious production TRL eight to nine and their capacities should be in some gigawatt hours on electrode uh, production and several hundred megawatt hours on uh, cell manufacturing capacity in all sizes. And uh, based uh, or um, uh, this as a core element is um, the center of activities of our national ministry for um, research um, and uh, what is called an umbrella concept for battery research but um, Jürgen Janek will show in the next presentation a little bit more in detail what is all around. The idea is really to fill continuously the pipeline with new materials, new concepts, uh, which then can be brought further in this to finally be transferred into industry, into gigawatt uh, present, uh, production. And one of these IPSI, these uh, European projects of common interest, is um, EU BATIN. It's one of them. I just want to, to highlight uh, here this is a project where governments uh, spend uh, something like four, four to, uh, two billion euros just for this uh, IPSI project, uh, and they expect an unlocking of additional five billion in private investments. And this is for manufacturing um, elements along the whole value chain from the raw material and the material production to cell modules, battery systems, but it was a clear focus on the material and um, cell production lines. And um, we are talking a lot about the American um, program to support uh, renewable energies. In total, the money which Europe, in Europe spent is not less. Yeah, so this has been shown by some studies, but it seems to be much more difficult to get to the money, especially for the companies. Yeah? So the main issue is not the amount of money, it is uh, really the, the difficulties to get to it. So in the industry, what does the industry? There are at least two major uh, automotive groups uh, setting up now uh, gigafactories. On the one hand, it's ACC, this is uh, Stellantis, Total Energies and Mercedes-Benz. Um, they are going for a production line now which would come up with about 13 gigawatt hours per year by the end of this year and then going up to 40 gigawatt hours and um, for, in, with more factories within Europe it should come to 250 gigawatt hours in Europe by the end of the decade by this group and quite similar are the uh, concepts of uh, Volkswagen. Powerco is uh, the uh, da daughter especially for the battery part here and they are now setting up the first uh, gigafactory in Salzgitter, others to come in Europe, but also in Canada, for, for example, uh, also aiming for 200, 240 gigawatt hours battery capacity by 2030. Just to have in mind, this first uh, gigafactory by Tesla um, it started in 2013, had 30 gigawatt hours battery capacity, and at that time, this factory doubled the worldwide production capacities. Now we are talking just for Volkswagen about 240 gigawatt hours by the end of the decade. So the challenges are definitely high. One more word about uh, recycling. There are strong targets with regard to recycling, but we should be really aware that until this really lowers our demand on primary resources, takes a long time, you know, because we are now on an exponential curve in ri ri rising up, and we hope that the batteries stay at least 10 years in the car before they get back to the recycling. And from this you can learn easily that even in 2035, less than a quarter of the materials can come from recycling because they are still there. And this means we have to assure that uh, the raw material or the, the primary mines uh, are uh, ex uh, extended significantly, but we also should be aware that um, when the recycling really works, the demand from these mines decreases relatively soon. Yeah? So 
um, this means we have to convince the mining companies to set up huge capacities for the coming 10 years, and then we say, oh, it was nice, but now we're doing it with our recycled materials. And you know, mining is a business which is calculating in decades, and uh, not in 10 years uh, of time or something like this. So something we should, really should keep in mind. So, and finally, and this is mainly the things I'm working on also, um, when having cells of any type, every shape, whatever, there are a huge number of aspects which have to be looked at uh, and, uh, for the integration in the system about cell sizes, uh, cell design, interconnection, voltage levels. Yeah? So, some uh, think about going up to 1,500 volts. Yeah? Uh, uh, this is a huge number of cells connected in series, and always the worst cell is limiting the performance. It's about smart charging, it's about thermal management, pressure, sensors, diagnostics, models, and especially also these vehicle-to-home and vehicle-to-grid strategies. We talked about the balancing of uh, capacity. We should be aware that with just 4% of the vehicles uh, being electric in Germany now, these batteries already drive around battery capacities which is two times higher than all what our pumped hydro power stations have in common. Uh, and uh, if we bring this uh, with even a relatively low power rating to the grid, there's huge capacity uh, to balance uh, things. So for the short-term balancing, we really do not care too much because especially we can show that these additional services to the grid almost do not harm the batteries uh, additionally. Uh, so this is not the main issue. The main problem is really what was discussed this morning, long-term storage. Uh, we can do balancing for 24 hours relatively easy, but we can't do for three weeks. Yeah? And this is uh, where we have to go additionally with hydrogen or something else. So, and I will let it with this and hope we have some time for discussion later on. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. So my name is Jürgen Janek. Uh, I'm a professor in physical chemistry at the Justus Liebig University in Gießen, so short JLU. And I'm also a part-time professor at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology where I direct a 50-50 lab funded by KIT and BSF company on, on cathode materials. Um, <clears throat> and I'm a member of the National Academy and uh, working uh, essentially on, on solid-state electrochemistry. And I think Der Groove and me, we decided that I would a bit more focus on the German ecosystem at such and the, uh, let's say, let's call it post-lithium uh, uh, systems. Um, so let me explain that first of all. A few numbers. Um, so we have uh, about, uh, let me see how this works here, right? <clears throat> so we have in Germany a fleet roughly of 50 million passenger cars. Uh, and each of these cars is driving per year about 13,000 kilo 13, kilometers. So taking these numbers, digesting them, we would need, if we transform uh, in a single step uh, all these cars, we would need an uh, electric uh, energy of about 100 25 terawatt hours, which is 20% of we, what we currently produce in electric energy. So it, is, it will not compromise fully. And just remember, it's, it's an extreme consideration. It's the complete, complete conversion of the fleet right now, which of course will not take care, We're, uh, even not 2% not of the fleet converted. Um, now, <clears throat> bringing that now into, uh, into batteries, it means let's assume that we would like to go 400 kilometers with each car. Uh, and assume that we need 20 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers, we need a battery of 80 kilowatt hours, and that we need to translate that, of course, in a minute into, into tons of materials. But first of all, all these batteries would be a, a huge storage of 3,800 gigawatt hours. Huh? So that's something we should also um, remember. And that, of course, is why, why, we, why we need gigafactories. Huh? And I think Dirk Uwe already commented on what is the typical size. So this was the starting point with 20 gigawatt hours. So we need quite some gigawatt, it's quite, it's quite some giga factories uh, for batteries. And I will have a more slide on the chemistry, but the cell chemistry, let's take as the approximate value that we need, that we gain about, or can we store about 250 watt hours per kilogram of, of cell. So not the whole pack, but the cell, the elementary storage cell. Then this means we need four kilogram of chemistry per kilowatt hour. And that means for a whole fleet, if we would transform it right now, we would, meet, we would need 15 million tons of special chemistry. Well, is that, is that a lot or not? Well, a raw steel, Germany just produces um, uh, about 35 million tons per year, and cement also 35 million tons per year. So compared to these, 
uh, uh, products. Of course, it's not so much, but it's a specific uh, uh, chemistry, including quite some valuable uh, uh, elements. And these is, and Dirk Uwe already said, the two current competitors. One is the so-called graphite NCM cell, where N stands for nickel, cobalt, manganese, or nickel, cobalt, aluminum, which has an energy, a specific energy of, well, between 250 and 350, that may jump up if we are able to replace really the graphite that, of course, stores the lithium quite dilute by a lithium metal anode, which was, uh, I think, mentioned by Doran in his presentation. But this is really difficult, and I think is one of the most difficult tasks in electrochemistry, to get the lithium metal anode or sodium metal anode operating safely, long-term, fast chargeable. So I think this is really, really uh, a big adventure. Now, <clears throat> as it was already mentioned, uh, we can replace the NCM by LFP, which is lithium iron phosphate. Then we, don't, we only have abundant materials, <clears throat> if you believe that we can have also enough resources of phosphate. And however, you see the spe specific energy is lower. And I would say, we will say that in the best case, we may just approach, I would say, a not so powerful uh, uh, high performance NCM cell. But Volkswagen said already a few years ago, they said, okay, 80% of our cars, particularly the budget cars, can run with lithium iron phosphate, driven already, of course, by, by Elon Musk, who also, let's say, already did that. Now, what is important is that, uh, um, of course, this is very difficult to be forecasted by me as a, as a, as a, as a chemist. There are so many, many boundaries behind that, but what we see is, of course, there's a lot of speculation going on with all that stuff. And when there's the risk of speculation. I think we need to avoid a lithium monopoly and the monopoly of a single technology. And that's why sodium is entering the race. Sodium is, you know, you may say this is the heavy sister or a brother of, uh, of, of lithium, has quite some problems. Uh, but there is already sodium ion batteries. Uh, it needs still some time to be developed, but that can compete with lithium iron phosphate cells. And then we can avoid lithium. Uh, and sodium ion batteries may be constructed without nickel and cobalt, just with iron and manganese oxides or other, I would say, abundant uh, materials, which is, I think, the interesting point. Okay, now, um, not wasting <clears throat> too much time, let me, let me continue. What uh, uh, I think I have here is a bit who is funding, let's say, these, or who has programs in batteries in, in Germany. So this is, of course, all the players in the academia, but, of course, Fraunhofer Society and Helmholtz Association have their own programs on battery research. There's, of course, the, op the public funding agencies, DFG, for fundamental research. BMBF is the Federal Ministry of Education and Research. They fund more applied research, where typically industry is being involved, or the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and, sorry, for Gondomic Affairs and Climate Action of Germany, quite a long name, uh, which is very much industry-oriented. Um, and, of course, there's the European Union. I will not touch on that because I'm more on, from the German scale, but, of course, there is large-scale uh, projects that currently try to extend this Battery 2030 program, uh, which had some problems. But I think they, they will work hard to continue with that because that project ended uh, this year. Now, as I said, I think... I think Germany, in a sense, uh, I know I'm being part of this ecosystem, I think I'd be quite proud to have installed really, I would say, a very well-working ecosystem for battery research. Um, and this is what is uh, hidden behind this uh, term, the umbrella concept by the federal ministry, which really created a kind of pipeline with different, I would say, actions and activities from fundamental science to really industrial production, where I think you may identify three different levels. There is specific projects, really, it can even be academic projects, typically a million euro per year, um, to larger competence clusters, about seven to 10 million euro per year, and then, of course, as Dirk Uwe already said, the Fraunhofer Research Facility Battery Cell, this is now the English official name, uh, which is really kind of state-funded uh, big pilot line uh, to invite all major companies to, to take part of it. And I think the, without this uh, pilot plant, I think so far about 0.8 uh, billion euro went into uh, battery funding in Germany. Now, GFG is also funding, but you know GFG is not mission Based the German Research Foundation, it's uh, you can request for money, and there is no, let's say, uh, uh, no specific mission. Anyhow, within the um, Excellence Initiative in Germany, there is also huge research clusters, and there is one research cluster that is the Post Lithium Storage Cluster in Karlsruhe, Ulm, and in Gießen, which is exclusively working on uh, on post lithium uh, electrochemistry for batteries, e conversion in, in Munich, and there is also a um, 
storage, uh, well, not it's not a storage project, it's a, it's, a, it's a cluster for the future of aviation, where a bit of batteries go in. Now, I think the private sector, let me just briefly touch it because uh, Dirk Uwe already said that. Um, I think the German ecosystem is very much, I would say, characterized by, of course, the major well, big companies, uh, I think, doing the game. Anyhow, I think, and we always see or think that we are not so good with startups, but recently there's quite some startups and batteries coming up, and that's accelerating very due to the good funding situations. But of course, there could be more, I would say, venture capital for, uh, for startups. And as Dick Uwe also nicely said, uh, I think Volkswagen really has a big, I would say, uh, starting a big adventure trying to become also a cell producer like, uh, like Tesla is doing it. Now, what are the topics in post-lithium? And I think to make that very simple, there is clear-cut advantages, of course, for singly charged ions in electrochemistry that do not polarize their surrounding so much that they can move fast enough. And you need ions that move fast. So that's, of course, the lithium battery, or the lithium ion and the sodium battery. And that's why I think the sodium and the lithium batteries, of course, I think they are really realistic. Uh, I think there is also redox flow batteries that rely on a different principle that uh, also rely anyhow on, on singly charged uh, ions uh, exchanging between the electrodes, but uh, I, I developed for large scale systems. There's lots of other systems that are really, I would say, on the research level, not on any higher TRL, uh, but need to be followed. As I said, we need alternatives even in the far future because I think there should be no monop monopoly. And one of the big differences and why the lithium ion battery, of course, works so well, it's just solution chemistry. The lithium is just being dissolved in the electrodes. So what you do is just dissolve it from one side to the other. It's, it's really very soft chemistry. Uh, but in all many other cells, you have really to create phases, nucleation, phase growth, and that's kinetically much more demanding and then of, of problems. Uh, a few examples of projects. I think then I'm, I'm, I'm done. What I think is... Uh, Really, very that the federal ministry runs a few international programs, so bilateral programs, US. So that's a joint program between BMBF and DOE on internet batteries, with Taiwan on hybrid cell concepts, with uh, Japan, with NATO on post lithium batteries. And of course, uh, Doran, uh, I'm really happy to see you. And uh, you know, we are all very depressed uh, because we have been in uh, Engedi in the kibbutz just in March with all the uh, Israeli juniors and uh, I wish we in a more lucky situation today. Um, you can be sure that we also, and I hope that we can extend this very, very successful project with the battery, the German-Israeli battery school, uh, for the next, which works on novel cell concepts and particularly is meant to exchange. There's a German-French project program coming up and be funded. So I'm directing a cluster on solids, which is just has the German acronym FESTBOT, which means that in, in a sense, which is a big cluster with uh, more than 22 research institutions where we try really to develop, uh, to, I would say, to further develop the lithium battery into a concept where it doesn't include, include any more organic liquids, uh, what is uh, in the extreme ceramic uh, cell. And uh, the concept of this cluster is that we have everything on board from uh, into this, from material synthesis, via components, electrodes, even to processing and production and simulation of all these steps. Uh, and the next step will be that we enter with that into the research fab uh, in the next year. So I think this is quite quite nice, and we are now more no, more than 200 scientists, and our budget is about happy and a bit more. Uh, for three years, and it will be hopefully uh, for another five years. There is this excellence cluster pool for storage funded by DFG, which is really fundamental and which focuses really exclusively on these, I would say, earth abundant elements and their um, chances and potentials to create large scale um, storage, particularly also for the uh, for grid storage and for yeah. So upscalable storage and the singly charged ions, of course, have the advantages and the others are more, more difficult. So there is a clear cut uh, subject, and that is that uh, solid state batteries is, I would say, not po it's just post lithium ion battery without liquid electrolyte. They will contend with all the lithium ion battery applications, and we'll see whether at the end 
pay off. There is lots of investment worldwide into that. I think the major hope is that we can operate there with lithium metal anodes, which also make a jump in, in, in storage capacity, uh, capacity and, and energy. Sodium definitely will come, and I think it's attractive, uh, um, I think alternative and world which is going to that, of course, already China, but the US will also fund project here. I think as uh, he, uh, I think, uh, told me, um, I think they may concentrate also on batteries and things. I think aqua systems have to be re, re and there's lots, of course, of si interesting scientific challenges. I'm, this, I'm not a technology, uh, I'm not an engine, I'm interested in basic things, and there's still really tough fundamental issues to be solved. So uh, with that, the end, uh, and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Um, so who wants to get oh, that this is already there. So we do it in that, in that sequence. So Jeff, you get started. Uh, thank you, Robert. Um, my question has to do with uh, maybe the last two presentations. I, I, you know, I, you talked about a, a large amount of investment in these gigafactories to uh, make a lot more uh, batteries to meet the, the current demand. And it looks like those are going to be focused primarily on lithium ion. And then the uh, last presentation really talked about that's fine but there's better things coming um, is are we off a little bit in terms of this big investment in these gigafactories um, if they if they focus on uh, technologies that will soon be obsolete or, or is there nobody worried about that issue um, yeah let, let me start I think this is always the discussion whether the next generation cells will be greenfield or brownfield uh, investments so whether you can just uh, reuse an existing facility or just have to uh, set up a new one and I think all the uh, the companies uh, I would say uh, usually say that you, this is all greenfield if there's a new technology uh, they, they expect that there will be um, new uh, plant being installed but don't misunderstand me I think there will probably be nothing really better with respect to battery performance than lithium-ion batteries Expect, except maybe advanced lithium-ion batteries or lithium batteries with metal anode that can be maybe have more capacity. The sodium-ion battery will never, for physical chemical reasons, will never be better in performance. It can be better with respect to carbon footprint, uh, ecological reasons, and so on. So it might be better in total, yeah, but not in uh, uh, not looking just for the mere battery performance. But maybe just, I, I just, 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 maybe just to, ah, okay, please. No, you go ahead. I was just going to add what uh, Jürgen said. Yeah, me, me too. So, what to, to, okay. to add. Please. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I just uh, want to say, um, uh, the, the point is, at the end of the day, we have something like past dependencies. Yeah? So the next uh, technologies to come will be most probably those which can be produced on the existing lines. Yeah, and therefore, sodium ion, for example, is a good candidate, yeah, as uh, Jürgen also uh, mentioned. This has a very good chance because at least in the cell production, you can use more or less the same uh, lines. Yeah? And uh, if you would come with uh, something which need new factories, it will be extremely difficult yeah? because for sure those which are there uh, will, uh, will do a lot of competition. They can drop prices more and more and more. It will be difficult to come in there. So probably the biggest challenge is in the companies doing the, cathode, the electrode materials. Yeah? There the changes uh, will be significant, but not in the production lines uh, for the cells. I just want to agree with Dirk, right? So essentially, that's just a challenge for developing any new technologies beyond or different from the existing conventional lithium ion is how we actually compete in terms of manufacturing, right? So our electrodes are made at something speed of 10 meter per second, and how can we maintain this level of sort of speed and also the worldwide uh, production scale? And this is really part of the challenge. But so you can highlight it. There are opportunities. You see that for the past decade of lithium ion batteries largely driven by, let's say, the top OEMs uh, in the car industry, and it's really the driver has been energy density. As you can see that in the past five years, the market is going uh, segmenting, going through a low cost, lower energy, uh, where it can really take off in regions like Europe or US, the coastal areas, we have a lot of charging stations, so driving anxiety is not a, a, a big challenge, but in 
other regions, let's say some aspect of regions of Asia or in, in between the coast in US where high energy batteries are still required. So, so for example, for these reasons, uh, sodium batteries that can really have an opportunity because they provide a relief valve when we have really the, the critical uh, challenge uh, with uh, lithium supply, even though uh, you know, one may argue that we have a lot of lithium, more lithium than nickel or other transition metals. Okay, please. Thank you. Um, so let me draw a couple of threads together. Patricia said that we need to come down below a dollar a kilowatt hour for longest term storage, month or more. Uh, and we've heard that we can do caverns for half of that. I've been to half of the compressed air energy storage facilities in the world, that is one, in McIntosh, Alabama. It's not sexy. And so you're not going to get tenure working on K's, compressed air energy storage. But I continue to feel that compressed air energy storage has to be part of the solution. Now, you're not going to do it without burning some gas or, if you like, some hydrogen. But I do feel, as somebody who spends most of the time dealing with the grid, that the kinds of uh, battery storage solutions that we're talking about uh, will not be the end of the story. Yes, we have in the US this year surpassed the amount of pumped hydro storage with grid connected batteries. But if you want to go truly month to seasonal storage, I think people are going to have to consider K's. And I just don't see the level of research in K's uh, that I think it demands. Was this a question or a comment? At least, uh, at least I would like to answer some, uh, I would to, to, to comment this. So we are discussing this in Germany as well, since 20 years or more. We have in Hunsdorf also one of these compressed air energy systems. Uh, that's one of the two yeah, in the world, or the three. There were several companies like RWE uh, always claiming we would like to have more of them. They started and, uh, again and they did stop uh, all these activities. Why? Because at the end of the day, the, stru the structure and the service these systems can offer is exactly the same like a pumped hydro power station. And also there's nobody in Europe really building new pumped hydro power stations anymore. Yeah? The reason is uh, they are not um, part of the long-term storage. They are short term, eight hours. This is uh, Hundorf is two hours, Macintosh maybe 13 hours, I'm not uh, exactly. Something in this range. Yeah? So um, they compete directly, especially with all these, um, these um, vehicle to grid and, uh, and other strategies. And with these, uh, the, the competition is maybe not fair because uh, if you really bring together fleets of electric vehicles, uh, you can offer services to the grid at marginal cost of nearly zero. Yeah, because you buy the car because you want to have mobility. And uh, the batteries, if you offer 20% of the capacity, are not really aging. Yeah? So you don't have uh, aging, which you have to account for. Sure. It's I mean, I've flossy. published on that as well. But the, uh, just but, like with a battery, you can use Ks as long or as short as you like. And so if people are really serious about seasonal storage, I think there has to be some more work there. And of course, the reason why we're not building more Ks is you can't make any money at it. The reason why we're building other kinds of storage is it's subsidized currently. Yeah, but, but you would use for the compressed air the same type of caverns as for the hydrogen or for the natural gas. And the energy density is, I don't know, a factor of 50 less or something like this. This means you increase the 50 euro cent by a factor of 50 per kilowatt hour. And then you're far away from uh, the targets uh, which have been mentioned. Yes, but we have air. We haven't got hydrogen at scale. Frau Schill, bitte. I wanted to ask you uh, the timeline of the recycling. I learned from you that the battery lasts longer than the car. So you, you said something about 10 years. I'm asking this question because in this EGS uh, technology, which I presented before, we circulate uh, 250 tons uh, of lithium per year, and we are working on the extra extraction of this lithium. 
And uh, so if you say now in, in 2035 we don't need any more new lithium, uh, if, if I understood you correctly, then uh, we would stop this immediately. <laughs> No, my, my message was in that even in 2035, if we do 100% recycling and the batteries would last just 10 years, it's only 25% of the lithium we need for the new batteries comes from recycling, yeah? so under best conditions. So uh, at least at, uh, why, uh, right into the 2040s, uh, we would need uh, new lithium uh, from uh, primary sources. Uh, so uh, don't worry in this case, I would say. Thanks. Deepak, please. I really enjoyed uh, all the presentations. Uh, you know, it's a very important uh, topic. So um, I wanted to kind of uh, take up on, uh, on Yang what you had uh, said, you know, really. I think it's really critical, that, and you mentioned that, is that uh, it's, it's the new materials, it's the new technologies that are driving uh, the innovation, that are driving, you know, the prices down. And, you know, when batteries, like in solar, the prices have gone down by almost 90%. Uh, in, in 10 years. I mean, that does, that's not a normal process. That does not happen every day. And it looks like it can go down by another similar factor. Again, we don't understand all the issues that drive that kind of innovation, that kind of sustained learning curve. And I think because these technologies are moving fast, what you also mentioned is something I really have been pushing very strongly for, is that there needs to be an acceleration of uh, science to impact. And you know, how do you do that? I think we don't have proper translation processes in place at this point in time for taking new technology. And, and, and you know, what we saw in the, uh, in the German context out here is, is a very typical, very large, complex mechanism that is set up. I don't know how you get speed out of that. Okay, so this is a, a concern that, uh, that I have. You, you need smaller teams that really can move at the speed of lightning. So just you know, kind of uh, see if you have uh, anything to say on that. But also this, the second piece was, you know, in the IC industry, we see this all the time. As you get a new foundry is made uh, and you get more competitive, higher performance products in, the other guys drop their price, okay? And so you start creating a much bigger expansion of the market because you now have lower price devices available at the same time that you have higher performance devices available. I suspect the same kind of you know, transition will also happen out here, so please. Thank you for your comment. Uh, I completely agree with you. And it's really, you know, very often, as scientists, engineers, we work in silos, and we work on our hammers, right, polishing our hammers. And uh, very often, I think as we uh, accelerate uh, our ways of development of clean energy solutions, right, the, the, the needs and, uh, is very uh, dynamic. And what might be, for example, depend on the policy, depend on the materials, depend on the critical ability, depends on also the regional, for example, uh, resources. And so this is why I think it's very important uh, to work with folks in the policy, work folks in the techno-economics, uh, in, also in the area of financing. And I began to work with some of these groups, for example, within the Aspen Institute, and also with uh, some of the uh, future energy initiatives headed by former Energy Secretary Ernie Moniz uh, to looking at bring a broader perspective and so that we could have all the pieces potentially to look at how to accelerate these changes, to have such conversations, to learn from people we typically don't talk with is really critical. Thank you. But I think just to emphasize, I think it's critically important that we look outside what we do, our specialization. We create broader, holistic definitions of the problem we're trying to solve and not be technology specific because that's the one I, I work on, right? Uh, totally, we, we have to also sometimes uh, not only work on the hammers, but look for different nails, for example. We have three more questions and we are a little bit over time, so please, if possible, no comments, questions. Uh, I will try. <laughs> um, let me come back to, uh, I want to, because these are the colleagues, we already know each other for a long time in the battery space. I want to come, come back to the first things uh, I think the three academy need to pay attention to. So come back to scale again. Um, so looking at Germany's data, you need about 3.7 terawatt hour roughly. Do you guys know what's the yearly production of lithium ion battery nowadays after 30 years of building the, the factory? every year? 
600 gigawatt hour and plus the plant capacity haven't produced yet, it's about one terawatt hour. Germany alone can eat up four years of global production just for Germany, right? So we, I, want to, I want to emphasize this scale. Uh, just electric transportation alone globally, these one billion cars uh, require 100 terawatt hour of production roughly. So that's 100 years, by the way. So this scale is not trivial. I'm not talking about grid scale energy storage yet, just for electric transportation. Now this leads to my second, my, my, uh, second comment, is uh, what uh, uh, Jürgen just touched upon. Let's consider grid. That uh, probably added another 100 terawatt hour. How do we do that? Uh, that's why last night have, having dinner, I said we got to look at a grid system. I want, let me emphasize this, that ecosystem. The reason is, get to, get to billion ton level of battery, we need billion tons of materials. Hey, we don't know how to figure out any organic solvent you, did you see produced in 100 million ton level. No, you don't see anything like that. We have water. Let's look, look at aqueous chemistry. And uh, it's also safer. Uh, it's abundant, and also the uh, electron material got to be available. So I know you're looking at me about the time. I have more comment, but I'll stop right here. I wait for the dinner <laughs> to have more discussion. I, I would love to try to comment your question, but this is not possible, so we go to Carla, please. Yeah, thanks a lot for the overview. So I have a question to Professor Sauer. I mean, the pack, the battery packs and, and the battery systems, I mean, of course, the, the, um, the cell is, is the core um, and, and uh, determines um, the, the, the basic uh, performance. But what innovation is needed and what material innovation is needed in order to bring also uh, the battery systems um, to um, yeah, to, to, to be a standard product, but also a, a high performance standard product. So maybe just focusing on the question of materials, where we see mainly a demand is uh, on um, what we call compression pads. So applying pressure to the battery cells, because this is extremely beneficial for the lifetime, but it should be the right pressure and must be uniform. And at the same point of time, uh, if these materials would um, uh, inhibit uh, heat transfer from one cell to the others, uh, we would be extremely happy uh, to avoid um, such uh, thermal runaways uh, throughout the battery pack. It is typically not a real problem if, if, if a single cell in a battery pack goes into thermal runaway, but uh, if it uh, infects the other ones by high temperature, then we have a problem. So heat insulating systems and at the same point uh, giving over the lifetime of 10, 15 years something like com constant compression. This is uh, from a materials point of view uh, what I would say in the battery pack is uh, most uh, interesting at this point in time. Thank you. Final question from the floor, Bernd. Uh, very, uh, I make it very quick. Why are stationary batteries you use in a private household more expensive than those batteries driving around in the car? Okay, um, first of all, this is ex absolutely right. Yeah? So indeed, uh, we pay at the moment in Germany on average 1,000 euros per kilowatt hour for a stationary system. And for this, you can buy also a, car, a battery in a car with a car around. Yeah? So uh, it's cheaper to buy a Tesla and, uh, with a, for bat per, bat per battery capacity. Yeah, why? why? Um, first of all, uh, it is uh, including electronics with power electronics uh, installation and so on. It's marketing. You have to sell each of these uh, systems individual. You know, such a battery pack has uh, 5,000 euros or something like this. So the one who's doing the marketing for you and who is visiting you to convince you and so on already consumes 1,000 euros of this. Yeah? So, but uh, we're we are sure. So you can buy meanwhile uh, packs at 700 euros per kilowatt hour. Um, 500 is maybe possible, but um, it will stay more expensive. It's a consumer product, an end user consumer product, and you sell individual systems. Sorry. <laughs> by, by the way, the PV system on my roof is also two to two times more expensive than the one on the free field. Yeah? So I just want to mention this is not a, not a, not a specific phenomenon of batteries. <laughs> yeah, I just want to say maybe we, we need the, the, the car OEMs to drive the cost down for stationary. 
we, we, so, we, we tried. Yeah? We tried, and some car manufacturers tried to go there. <laughs> Tesla is still doing, Mercedes did, but they, all, they went out of this business because they need every person to bring forward their cars. This is their argument. They have simply no capacities left in, uh, in human resources uh, to deliver uh, into the other markets. It's crazy. Yeah? Yeah, Tesla is doing this. And what yeah. about having the car like reversible, what do you call it, a double? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 I have the impression this conference has created a few new business ideas. I'm looking forward to some startup companies next month.